back to Tomer Ogula for IBC TV from beautiful Ohio with my best friend, Dr. Karen Cooper. We worked together for 10 years almost at the yes, Cleveland Clinic. Yes. Dr. Cooper is a director of uh, weight manager ma management uh, for yes. Women's Health Institute at the yes. Cleveland Clinic. Yes. Uh, and I recently uh, saw her um, on Facebook events, Facebook live event, uh, explaining the importance of weight loss uh, for, um, for women patients. Um, uh, I thought about uh, a you know, very important thing that uh, we bariatric surgeons deal every day with, with uh, our patients. Mm -hmm. How should we talk to our patients? Most of us uh, are uh, small practice uh, or small groups. Sometimes we don't have luxuries like uh, you have in Cleveland Clinic uh, having medical managers. Uh, so we need to talk to those patients uh, ourselves and manage uh, weight loss ourselves. What would be your practical advice for bariatric surgeons like myself? How should we talk to patients before surgery? How them prepare? How how get them prepared for surgery? Yeah, I think that's very difficult, even when you're not a surgeon, because the management of obesity really requires a team, mm -hmm. um, and not everyone is fortunate enough to have mm -hmm. that team. What's really really important is. Um, for the patient to feel like he or she is being heard, mm -hmm. you know, even more so than um, um, all the interventions you think you might need to do, because you can't be the the dietitian mm -hmm. and the psychologist and the medical doctor and the surgeon, mm -hmm. but just f uh, letting the patient know that you understand mm -hmm. what's going on with them and that you're going to be there to help them get from where they are to where they want to be mm -hmm. and that you are going to do everything in your power to make sure that it is a good journey that they understand and that you will connect them with the resources that they need if you don't have them there clinically is very, very important. Mm -hmm. I think more than anything else, the patient needs to feel like they're being heard. Mm -hmm. So even if you feel that, oh, I can't do everything mm -hmm. that I'd like to offer, just being a good listener mm -hmm with the patient mm -hmm. is very significant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Yeah. So another thing that we struggle uh, frequently uh, are patients who gain weight. Yes. A lot of them, they don't have anatomical abnormalities that can be corrected. Yes. Uh, and the next step is medical management. And we honestly, we will lack that knowledge and experience that you have. Mm -hmm. How should we uh, um, let them uh, go through the journey and how should uh, we help them to go yes. through it? So with the weight regain, um, it is um, critical to use other resources as well. Mm -hmm. I think that bariatric surgery is incredibly effective in terms of getting a lot of the weight off, mm -hmm. and it is a very good tool. When you compare it to non-surgical management, it's going to give you the, the best, the most effective way for weight loss. Mm -hmm. But there are going to be some of those patients that are going to regain the weight or mm -hmm. struggle with keeping uh, most of the weight that they lost mm -hmm. off. And so that's where the medications, we now have more medications mm -hmm. um, in our arsenal to use. Um, I think there's there's good use for a combination mm -hmm. of surgery plus medications mm -hmm. to help keep the weight maintained at the level that they were able to lose mm -hmm. with the surgery. Of course, we know that the psychological piece is very important, right? And most of our patients got to the morbidly obese state, not just from engaging in um, lifestyle behaviors that did it, but it's also about the root of why did they get into those behaviors. Um, and so if you have resources that include the psychologist, counseling would be very important support groups mm -hmm. for the patients. They seem to like that very much. Mm -hmm. Having group supports or having shared medical mm -hmm. appointments are really important in terms of um, helping them to know that there's a place that they can come to. Even um, if we utilize social media like Facebook and have a closed Facebook group where they can come and they can talk about their challenges and their successes, um, I think just being able to share those stories are very, very helpful for the patient. But in my experience, I've utilized not just counseling with weight regain, but medication. I don't think that there's anything wrong with doing a combination of therapy to ensure that the good work that you've done as a surgeon continues to be that way. So we mentioned about medications. I know uh, it's been very long, ongoing discussion <laughs> about the effectiveness of those medications. As far as I remember, most of them, they uh, were not very effective. Is there anything new currently? Right. So 
when you think about how effective they are, they're not going to help you get 100 pounds off or 50 pounds off in that short period of time that most people think. That's why, in my opinion, they are mostly um, uh, useful more in terms of preventing more weight gain. Mm -hmm. So I don't really expect my patients to lose a lot of weight with the medication, but I do expect the medication to help them not regain more weight as long as they are following, they're engaging in exercise activity and monitoring. So I forgot to mention that in terms of weight regain, we also need the input of the dietitian for support, right? Because it's very easy to lapse back into um, old eating habits and styles. And then when there's a life crisis, you know, someone who might have been coping with life, with foods when it didn't go so well, if that happens, it's going to be um, easier to get back to that state. So if there's an opportunity to have that dietitian counseling, the psychological counseling, the psychology in there, but also I think the medicines are really important in terms of helping to prevent further weight gain or to ward off some of the weight gain. I, again, I really don't expect a tremendous amount of weight loss with it, I, but I expect for them not to gain more weight. So if they lose one or two pounds, you know, a month on the medication, to me that's success because they're not regaining any of the weight that they've lost. Yeah. Well, one other thing, uh, I your function, your role at the clinic, clinic is, is quite unique. I think mm -hmm. it's a, one of the very few institutions that provides uh, medical uh, uh, weight management for women. For, yes. for, for, for um, uh, Why Cleveland Clinic came up with this idea and what is your actual role, what, what you're doing and how, how, is, uh, how can you measure the success of your, yeah. of your role? Yes, because what... Um you, you can't know what can't be measured, right? You can't tell the progress of something that can't be measured. Um, well, Cleveland Clinic, as you know, is, is a very innovative um, organization. And um, one of the first ones to start with bariatric surgery and the progression of bariatric medicine. Um, in the institute that I'm in, it is primarily a, a, an institute for women's health, for obstetrics and gynecology. And so, um, a lot of the excess weight connected to some of those diseases that women, that affect women, um, really need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. So again, like during pregnancy, you know, if you can help a woman gain um, the appropriate amount of weight during pregnancy, then she may not end up having preeclampsia or gestational mm -hmm. diabetes or um, hypertension that will exacerbate the fetus and the delivery and the mom. Mm -hmm. um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which can easily divert into diabetes, if you can help the patient in terms of um, not only nutrition and exercise activity, um, but also with some medications that tend to support that, that all comes into that lifestyle behavior of, let me support the woman who has PCOS, where it's easier for her to gain weight, easier for her to become insulin resistant, easier for her to become diabetic, and harder for her to um, to conceive. So weight management is really critical for that woman also. We've also have um, women who have difficulty with weight gain with menopause. You know, with the change in hormones, it's really hard to stop the spread that occurs. And so, you know, they need some intervention as well. Um, I think that if you look at it across the whole gamut, there is no place, no place at all in medicine where and when I say medicine, I'm also including surgical procedures where um, the benefit of having someone who helps with weight management, either surgically or non-surgically, is not important. I, I actually think it's pretty critical and that we should have always have all of our patients evaluated and we should it should be um, seamless that someone who has a body mass index of 30 or above is, is immediately connected to um, a team that will help them in terms of um, uh, managing, mm -hmm. managing excess weight gain because that's just, that just makes other things not go so well. You know, even in terms of um, getting someone ready for surgery, mm -hmm. not just bariatric surgery, but any other type of surgery, orthopedic mm -hmm. surgery, mm -hmm. you know, helping that person get some weight off if they are obese or morbidly obese, and many of them are because if they have pain, they're unable to move as well. Um, allows the surgeon to, um, you know, use techniques in a better way, but also 
um, gives the patient an advantage in terms of recovery, you know, so it's needed, it's critical, whether it's surgical or non-surgical, it is needed in every aspect of a person's health if that body mass index is continuing to go up. L let me ask you, because this is very interesting, uh, I, I think uh, most of us uh, never heard about uh, the role like you, uh, you do. Uh, wh what's the streamline of patients uh, in terms of referrals? So uh, I'm assuming you uh, have patients coming from uh, the, the Women's Health Institute. Yes. Uh, patients who are planning to have family or who are pregnant already and they, s they are sent to you, you manage them and you follow them afterwards, that's how it is? Well, actually I... I'm open to all women. Mm -hmm. So we do have, I did start out doing more with the pregnant patients, but our midwives have been wonderful in, in um, really directing that care along with the dietitian and doing more of what we call centering with them. Mm -hmm. So um, someone who is, we like to be careful, someone who is uh, a reproductive aged woman who knows that she wants to conceive within the next year or so, we like to try to get her ready for that in terms of, okay, let's look at your body mass index. Mm -hmm. Let's try to make sure that you're in optimal health mm -hmm. to conceive and to have a really good and safe pregnancy and a really good delivery. Mm -hmm. You know, perhaps you won't have to have the C-section, you know, or you won't have to have um, a complication if we can make sure that you're at your optimal health before and during pregnancy. And the studies have shown that women who are closest to their ideal body weight at the time that they conceive their pregnancy, um, is the outcome of their pregnancy is much better compared to someone who is not. So. Yeah, so those types of, of, of women are flagged as well as um, anyone else really who is um, having a chronic mm -hmm. issue um, in seeing their gynecologist, mm -hmm. you know, um, where weight loss would be e effective and they may not meet the surgical criteria for weight loss. Okay. Well, I, I think it's, a, it's an excellent idea. Uh, I think uh, uh, it might be even expanded to other areas of medicine uh, which where obesity plays important role. Would you see any other uh, uh, specialties uh, w within medicine that might benefit from someone like you uh, being inside that uh, specialty? I do. I um, One um, set of patients that I really like, one patient population, are women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer mm -hmm. and um, need breast reconstruction. And so the plastic surgeons really need them to get to an ideal body weight as close as possible anyway, so that they can reconstruct the breast um, or, or both breasts um, in a particular fashion, particularly depending on the procedure. So something like the DIEP, which is the deep inferior epigastric mm -hmm. perforator um, procedure, it is really important to get the weight down as much mm -hmm. as possible so that when the surgeon is um, doing the incision, you know, the vertical incision and then uh, pulling both areas together, that it is all, it, 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 um, it comes out in a really lovely way, mm -hmm. you know, in the way that plastic surgeons yeah. like to see it. Um, but also th that really helps with the patient, yeah. Yeah. right? She needs to feel that um, despite her diagnosis, mm -hmm. despite her surgery, um, that she is still um, viable as a woman and that everything looks the way she wants it to look after the surgery, so after the reconstruction. So I do have that patient population that comes to me also for weight management. Then there are women who have been diagnosed with endometrial cancer mm -hmm. and they have had to have a hysterectomy. But the studies have shown that if they are overweight or obese, even after they've had the hysterectomy, they're at risk still for a recurrence mm -hmm. and so those patients are also sent to me or if they meet the criteria for surgery they're sent for bariatric surgery to get rid of that excess weight just to decrease the risk um, because they're at much higher risk decrease the risk of recurrence mm -hmm. so like I said it's it, it weight management excess weight gain we've learned um, um, incites so much that it runs the whole gamut, I think, of pretty much every medical specialty, every arm, mm -hmm. and that every arm could really benefit from bariatric physicians and bariatric surgeons being brought in to, to, um, to help with the overall health of the patient.
yeah. Well, that was very interesting. Uh, I, honestly, uh, I was surprised that uh, um, uh, uh, the, the function that you have uh, is uh, not spread out more than the clinical clinic. I, honestly, I never heard about anything like that in other institutions. And I think it is really worth implementing to, to other uh, institutions and, and, and specialties. It would be wonderful. It would really be nice if, if, if that could be done. I think one way of doing it is making sure that, well, you know, the insurance companies, that's, that's part of the barrier. Yeah, sure. And if we were able to do a lot of bundling, mm -hmm. you know, um, bundling that type of care to um, other, uh, the other types of care that the patient needs, that that would make it easier for other hospitals and, and other practices to have. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> that was great to have you. Uh, and thank you for a wonderful 10 years of working together oh, in the Tom, clinic. Oh, you, you, Dr. Rogley, it's, it's great talking to you. I mean, this is like, like you said, we're best friends, right? It's awesome talking to you, and um, I really enjoyed working with you. I really did. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. All the best for our members of IBC all over the world uh, from Cleveland, Ohio, Dr. Karen Cooper and Tom Rogula. <laughs>